Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we are joined by Dr. Sumit Ray, who works at the Holy Family Hospital in New Delhi as head of the critical care medicine and also as the medical superintendent. And of course, at the moment, he has many critical COVID patients under his care. And uh, we want to ask him about his experience uh, as a doctor in this unprecedented crisis and also about uh, these medicines we are seeing, which are being prescribed to uh, deal with COVID, to cure COVID. Um, which have not really been proven to be effective. So thank you, Dr. Sumit, uh, for joining us today in what must be a very distressing and uh, hectic time for you. Uh, so to start with, uh, can you tell us about what the situation is like in your hospital right now? What has it been like you know, uh, handling the ICU? We see that uh, the numbers are maybe slightly coming down in Delhi. So how has this been like? Is there... A, a somewhat reduction in the load you're seeing or you know is it still a situation where you have to turn patients away so uh Strongya, what has happened in the last four days there is a reduction in the number three four days is a reduction in the number in the in the casualty or the emergency room as we call it so but before that it was it was beyond uh absolutely out of control the number of patients coming in there, uh, we have 30 beds in the ER. I'll just take you through this 30 beds in the ER. We, at, any, at any point of time, we had 100 patients almost. There are patients sitting on chairs getting oxygen because there was no space to make them lie down. There was no physical space to put a stretcher. There are families, sometimes we had to ask the families who were with them, like one attendant was allowed. They, we had to ask them to step out because there was, there was no space to breathe in the ER. It was that bad. He had no place in the wards or in the ICU for lots of patients. Even if we took people into the ER because we were trying to not refuse anybody at least to give primary care, we could give oxygen, et cetera, and the first shot of steroids, et cetera. <clears throat> uh, so there were lots of people who could not get a bed in the ICU, could not get a bed in the ward. So they, some of, and we did not want to turn them away, but we did turned some of the patients away who came in ambulances, which were good quality ambulances, which could take them to the next hospital. We also received a lots of patients who had been all around the city trying to get to a hospital and had died on the way. They had died in the ambulance. Uh, so there were lots of patient, people who were like that, unfortunately. Uh, there were patients who had died, who died in our emergency room because as I said, we had no space in the hospital wards in the we tried to do the best we could in the ER. I mean, no space means no space. We had extended our facilities by 40% more beds. We put beds wherever we could. And in the ICU, we have trolleys between beds. There is no physical, even now, there is no physical space in my ICU to walk between beds almost. So the quality of care obviously cannot be the same level as it would be in a normal circumstance uh, in the ICU. Uh, so last three days, as I said, the ER has calm down has become a little more more towards normal i would say still much more loaded than it usually is we have in the 30 beds we have 50 to 60 patients which looks way better than what it was about 3 to 4 days back having said that the timeline of covid is such that patients who get hospitalized or are at home with oxygen a certain percentage will deteriorate you can do the best amount of treatment can do the right thing people don't realize that you know, that even if you, the doctors are doing the right thing, patients will deteriorate. A certain percentage do deteriorate. That's why even in the best healthcare systems, patients of COVID die because of that. So when they deteriorate, even 10%, 8%, 10% of them deteriorate on the, on the wards, there are about 350 patients in the wards in our hospital. Even 8 10% deteriorate, you make, you know, uh, calculate the number, about 30 to 40, 35 patients will deteriorate. So they are they have to move to be moved to the ICU and the ICU is clogged. Once they come to the ICU, a patient who goes on the ventilator, if they start doing better, it's a three to four week battle on the ventilator, right? We have increased our bed capacity in the ICU from 48 bed ICU, which was usually had 40 patients at any given time, 38, 40 patients. To now almost 66 to 68 patients because of the trolleys that we have put in. And we have taken the coronary care unit into also the ICU, COVID ICU. So there is no coronary care unit anymore. It's 100% COVID hospital. 
So 68 patients now and of 50 of them on ventilators. And we need even more ventilators. And this is 50. In the last surge, never where we require, did we require more than 30, 32 ventilators. We in increased our number of ventilators. We bought ventilators as fast as we could. Uh, we rented them. We have reached 50 ventilators, but we will need even more ventilators soon because patients will, as I said, deteriorate in the next few weeks. That's mm -hmm. how COVID uh, goes, I mean, a certain percentage. So that's, that's the situation we have. It is uh, difficult, uh, is, uh, is a very mild word, I would say. Mm -hmm. It is really, really beyond difficult. Having said that, I would like to say something else. The poor in this country have to a certain extent faced this even before COVID. Yeah. It has been triaging for them. I have trained in a public hospital in a public medical college in the 80s and 90s. And even later, we have seen the poor lie in the emergency two to three to a bed in government hospitals because they have no access to private hospitals. They are triaged to which patient you can accommodate in the ICU because there is always more patients than beds, than ventilators. So... This time, yes, the scale is even more. The poor are also dying, but it's also people like us. It has affected people like us, and that's why even more, uh, you, you know, we get to see this more uh, across the world and in the media. Yeah. And I think it's, if this is not a wake-up call to improve our healthcare infrastructure, then I don't know what will be. Right. And uh, oxygen seems to be amongst the most critical of this uh, uh, of what we need right now, which is, you know, the most crucial treatment, which I think COVID patients need at the moment. So uh, what we see is that the Delhi government is saying it needs uh, 700 metric tons of oxygen daily, but uh, it's just been reported that at least last week, it was uh, only an average of around 530 metric tons, mm -hmm. which was supplied. So can you tell us about this? What is the need and uh, how have you been managing in this, in this shortage? To tell you honestly, last week, last four or five days onwards, the oxygen supply has improved, improved to all the larger hospitals. We haven't been in trouble. Uh, the reserves that we now consider safe is about six, eight hours of reserve we consider safe now. It's a new normal. You know, earlier we would feel safe if there was a reserve of at least two days in our oxygen tank. Now we feel safe if there is six to eight hours reserve because we it was being cut so fine that we were sometimes down to half an hour reserves, two hours. I mean, so, so from there it has improved. Uh, actually the worst days were when in Delhi was supplied only a liquid medical oxygen of about 300 metric tons or the three to 350. Those were terrible days. Everybody was running helter skelter, every hospital. Right now, the bigger hospitals are much better off. The problem is with the smaller hospitals and basically those who those, those hospitals which depend on cylinders, oxygen cylinders, which have a lag time to fill them up and get them back into the system. So those are the hospitals which are facing a problem even now, but much less than before, because I can see it in the, there's a, there are WhatsApp groups for oxygen management uh, started by the government. I can see that there is almost no panic anymore. I mean, there was a few days back, there was, so that has surely improved, even with more than 500 metric tons coming in, I think the situation is much more stable. Probably we will need some more, uh, 700 probably is a, is, a, is, is a number which they want so that they can escalate, I mean, uh, have build surge capacity and increase the number of beds in, uh, in Delhi. So oxygen, what, but what has happened in the whole oxygen conversation or narrative is that people seem to have forgotten that oxygen is only one element of the therapy. We need ventilators, we need ICU beds, we need more beds, uh, we need more staff, staffing. Everybody is stretched beyond their uh, you know, capacity there. Uh, the people, are, I mean, the medicine, the, the, the doctors, the nurses, the uh, cleaning staff, the maintenance people, the, the people uh, maintaining the oxygen plant, et cetera, they are working way beyond the biomedical, the cleaning staff. They, the people moving oxygen cylinders from one place to another, they are working beyond almost physical capacity and endurance, almost without complaining. There will always be some people who will complain, but mostly people are volunteering, volunteering for more, 
that is the incredible part that i've seen uh, right right and uh, before we you know move on to the part of discussing the medicines and how effective they are and all of that uh, i want to uh, ask you about another aspect which i feel has not really been looked at enough you of course just now talked about the people running around to get us our oxygen and how you know they have been enduring all of this greater amount of stress working countless hours to to do this for us uh, at the same time of course we um, i want to ask you about the situation in uh, hospitals in terms of doctors nurses attendants and workers you know we have uh, cleaners and safai karmachari and all of them so how has this been affecting them in terms of their health mental health and also are they are they vaccinated so a fair number of people are vaccinated uh, how it is affecting their mental it depends on what kind of work they are doing so many of the residents and nurses uh, are web very uh, i mean they almost uh, are uh, been affected to the point that they they feel that we could have done better uh, if we had the resources if we didn't have such patient load they have seen young people die because of lack of resources dying in the er there have been resident doctors and nurses who have called me up just to say we have no complaints sir we just want to cry because they have seen us do a very good job in the previous surge and they know that we could save a lot of people even in the icu even on the ventilators we our outcomes were as good as the western world as good i'm not trying to brag but it was as good as the western world we keep keep uh, you know working on the evidence looking at the evidence looking at uh, our clinical outcomes etc it was as good as anywhere else and this time obviously the outcomes are bad because as as not as as good because we could not provide ventilators to those who needed them we could not provide icu beds to those who needed them obviously the outcome is going not going to be good and that's what they lament uh, that you know we know that we could have done better sir if there were these and and that 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 is going to affect them for a long long time and they are younger they are starting off their careers in many ways and uh, for them it's a difficult thing for people who uh, like me who are much older and have gone uh, you know experienced uh, a little more uh, in many ways yes it's a absolutely new situation in the scale it does affect us because we also feel that we could do better but as i said we are we have seen this to a lesser extent probably in the public health systems when we were young and when we were training so maybe we are a little better prepared but you are can never be better. well prepared for this it is it is having said all this i think it is it is very painful it is very uh in sometimes uh the the battle to keep all our hopes up losing hope is something we can't do and battling that is important and that's what we are fighting but at least now in delhi different parts will get affected differently now we see some light at the end of the tunnel in terms of the numbers we know that the numbers will come down if the numbers outside come down a few days down the line a few weeks down the line the numbers in the icus will also come down and till then we i mean at least there is some hope that if you work hard now we can pull through this crisis and reach a point where you can do even better um so you're talking about uh you know hopefully we'll be doing better but uh again looking at the situation right now uh coming back to the point of medicines you know we have we see patients families running around you know desperately trying to find medicines like remdesivir and there's ivermectin tabiflu i think these are the some of the common ones right. uh how how effective are these medicines so i'll go by the evidence okay so what is the evidence for remdesivir remdesivir is not a life saving drug it's a drug which has been the studies have shown that it is a small subset of patients who are on low requirements of oxygen if a patient does not require oxygen or requires very high oxygen or is in the ventilator it is does not save lives or reduce length of stay for those on low amounts of oxygen if started early you know if started within the first 7 to 10 days it reduces the length of stay in the hospital that is all it has been proven to do well is that beneficial yes it's beneficial to the system because if you get a bed 3 days earlier than you would get that puts that that we can place another patient there right 
so that's the role and i've said it in uh, in uh, in the news channels etc that do not if you are not getting it don't run around particularly patients in the icu it is not going to be a life saving drug if your loved one is in the icu requires and the doctor has prescribed remdesivir if you find it okay if you don't find it it is not going to probably change the course of illness in terms of medications like uh, fabiflu zero evidence zero evidence to support it it's useless it causes gastritis uh, you know and and it makes life miserable for the persons taking it most of them in terms of you know nausea etc and without any benefit ivermectin again the evidence is weak uh, there have been some studies there is a group in the us which uh, of doctors who promote inexpensive therapies they have been pushing for it the evidence is not very strong some from bangladesh and some from romania and some other papers have come in uh, to reduce the they suggest that it would reduce the need for hospitalization if started early to tell you honestly have, you know it's equivocal have i used it in this surge i have used it for patients not in the hospital those pre hospital because we are desperately trying to reduce the number of patients coming into the hospital because there was no space and i had no mind space to tell you honestly to argue with anybody because when i when i don't prescribe i wasn't prescribing it there were people saying okay that doctor prescribed it so i said look here the evidence is weak if you want to take it you go ahead i did not have the mind space to argue that you take or not take fabi flu i flatly said there was no benefit it is no evidence to suggest it has benefit so that's the thing steroids i would like to talk about steroids now steroids are very useful but timing is most important it is being overused some people are overusing it in the you know outpatient department practice they are starting it too early too early when the phase of viremia is there when the virus is still in the blood stream still in the body if you start using steroids it can be counterproductive because your immune system is necessary to throw out the virus of the body it's a necessary evil what the steroid does is tone down your immune system so that your immune response which causes the harm so so it's complicated that your the viral infection triggers an immune response for most people which is balanced but for some people it is dysregulated those who have a dysregulated immune response that dysregulated immune response causes the more damage to the lungs etc it's not just the direct effect of the virus so in those who have a dysregulated immune response starting steroids may be necessary but that should be after the phase of viremia or towards the end of the phase of viremia usually after 7 days and not for everyone in only those who have a hyperinflammatory response who who require oxygen or are having persistent fever their inflammatory markers the crp etc are high not for everyone getting steroids is dangerous it actually can cause more harm and that has to be emphasized do not start steroids early people we know have started steroids on the second day third day of fever they actually have a the fever may come down for a few days and then when it comes back it is a worse it's a more dangerous fever and uh, we also have a uh, hydroxychloroquine again which is uh, has not okay. been uh, proven to be effective but we see that no. even the icmr is recommending it right. so so why is that yeah so the aims icmr recommendation the new ones suggest that you could use fabiflu and ivermectin as i said the evidence for that is not much there and that also makes if somebody prescribes it is difficult to stop people from prescribing it hcq also the evidence is almost not there i mean uh, most of the studies have not real good studies randomized controlled trials have not shown benefit <clears throat> so i don't see any reason to prescribe it at all and uh, and how how about plasma therapy does it work plasma therapy is another one <laughs> which actually there is again no evidence for its use in even the icmr's own study with him showed no no benefit of the let us call the placid trial the uh, trials from outside abroad also have been shown randomized control trial which are the real uh, you know uh, which are the kind of what we can call as the gold standards of uh, research haven't shown any benefit there is some indication in a trial an observational trial that if it's the elderly a small subset of elderly with low antibody levels they are the ones who may benefit 
But actually, the problem with convalescent plasma, people don't realize, it can be harmful for two reasons in COVID. It's not without side effects. The two reasons is one, COVID predominantly is also a prothrombotic state. That means there is increased clotting, and plasma is used for promoting clotting. Okay. Second, if most of the patients who are worsening are worsening because of a hyperimmune response, an egg more aggressive immune response. And you are giving antibodies of the plasma to increase that response, right? So it's it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make logical sense. It is only in the subset who have low antibody levels, persistent viremia, particularly in the small subset of the elderly, it may benefit. For sure, in the others, it does not benefit. And it is a very interesting way of keeping the family occupied, making them run around helter skelter. And it's also part of our, I think, sociocultural being, the Indian sociocultural being that khun dene se taqat banti hai. So that works very well. And it, it is pretty useless, I think. And it has been promoted by a couple of centers, repeatedly come on television because promoted by a couple of centers. Uh, but there is no evidence to suggest. And I don't use it. I'll be, uh, I, I do not use it at all in the ICU, but there have been some of our doctors who have prescribed it also because of the fact that the families insist on it. So sometimes it becomes difficult in spite of yourself to convince them that this is going may be harmful. So they say, my patient is not doing well. What is your problem? So in spite, so in the last, last surge, I don't know the data for this surge because we haven't had time to collect the data. 3000 patients we had in the hospital, six, more than 600 in the ICU. And we use plasma in five patients. And this was under family pressure, not because we wanted to. So that's the number we had. So, you know, why do you think families are pressuring doctors this way, despite the advice doctors are giving? Why is there such a lack of trust? There has always been a lack of trust with the healthcare system, and understandably and justifiably so. Our healthcare system and our uh, has not represented itself, uh, you know, very well. Uh, <laughs> in the past. So there is a lack of trust, but this is more than lack of trust. This is not, it's actually, reason is different. This time, the reason to do it is probably information, an infodemic on <clears throat> COVID, and people do not understand the contextualization of medical knowledge, right? You have to contextualize. I keep this giving this example. When we were in third year MBBS, when we joined third year MBBS, when we started going to the clinics and looking at clinical subjects, we used to, when we read something, we thought that we had that disease. Every disease we read about, we had that disease. We used to call it the third year syndrome. Okay. So for people who cannot contextualize, so just reading numbers or reading data, you cannot contextualize to the disease process. It is very complex. The human body is very complex. It takes years of knowledge and understanding to get to it. Even then, we knew understand only some part of it. So no disrespect to people's intelligence. It is that it's a width and depth of information and knowledge which has its context. And if you do not understand to contextualize it, you will start trying to do therapies just because somebody has Googled it or somebody has, your some friend's brother, sister has uh, you know used it and they got better. They may have got better in spite of it actually. Right. And uh, I also wanted to ask you about vaccinations. Uh, so, of course, on the one hand, we don't have, you know, enough doses and so people are facing shortages and they're not able to right. get vaccinated. But on the other hand, there are people who don't want to get vaccinated because of all the misinformation right. that there is. Why do you think that is and, you know, what, what needs to be done about this? So, I wouldn't say misinformation. Uh, there is vaccine hesitancy to a certain extent because there, is a, there was a lack of data transparency about both the uh, both the vaccines. If you see the adverse events post immunization uh, for AstraZeneca vaccine, there is in, in, uh, there is uh, you know data from across the world that there is certain problems. One has to be aware of it. One has to not hide it. The tendency in India was to hide that data. The sixteen hundred patients who were vaccinated in the study in India, the phase three clinical trial, that data hasn't come out yet. So these are the reasons that, and if you see the other vaccine, the co-vaccine, the safety data is there, but the efficacy data is still not out. 
I mean, the real public uh, is not being published. So there is a lack of transparency in the process of giving uh, approval to these vaccines. You just, the other example has been just look at the FDA giving approval to Pfizer and Moderna. They gave, I mean, it was an absolutely public process. Anybody could go in and watch it. The process of giving uh, approval to these vaccines. The evidence was very strong. The evidence was out there. So, so all this helped vaccination much more. There will always be vaccine skeptics, but 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 most people would take the vaccine if they are fairly sure that the data that they get is uh, you know transparent. Right, and finally, Dr. Summit, to conclude, I uh, just want to ask you about you know looking at the situation right now, situation of the healthcare system, which is still under immense pressure. Um, cases which are, you know, even if in Delhi, maybe we're seeing mm -hmm. some reduction, but in the other states, they are rising, situation of oxygen, all of these, you know, crises which are still there. Right. What do you think about, you know, future waves? Because we're seeing that experts are saying even a third wave is inevitable. Will we be prepared right. then? Yes and no. We'll be better prepared than this one, probably. But if our basic health infrastructural facilities do not improve, do not strengthen, do not widen, do not, uh, you know, numbers increase in terms of beds, ICUs, primary care, secondary care, staffing, nursing, doctors, every, you know, technicians, etc., it is going to be, again, very, very difficult. We have to invest in health. I mean, everybody says that. I mean, everybody worth there was in, in the medical profession knows that. 1% or 1.2% of the GDP for public health is totally inadequate. There are so many expert groups which had said that 2.5 to 3% of the GDP into public health by 2025, we see no sign, no sign, sound of that being invested in any way soon. One is investment in infrastructure and in people, but also the other thing which we need to know and that should come from us, from the medical profession is accountability. Okay, a combination of investment and accountability. Good public health systems run on the basis of these two. Investment, accountability, and the third is equity. And, and, and all these three things are probably missing in this country. All these three things in terms of uh, investment, our accountability to people uh, as healthcare workers. And uh, third is uh, equity of distribution of health. Even in the vaccine issue, you see, you why would we be separate vaccination for, you know, you have an advantage in a private hospital, you go and pay money and get it earlier and better. That's, that's you know, this is not public health. That is inequitable public health. And I mean, the vaccination is a small example. I mean, in every way it is inequitable. So, so we have to improve upon all these things. So there has to be short-term targets, mid-term targets and long-term targets. Absolutely. And, and uh, the third wave also is going to hit us hard, but probably we will be better prepared than this one. Because in terms of oxygen, et cetera, I think we produce enough. It's the logistics of distribution that I think will be taken care of soon. That is that is probably, I think, the least difficult of, I'm not saying it's not difficult, but the least difficult of the problems. But the other problems are going to be, actually people, even if you have oxygen, if you don't have ventilators and ice tube beds, et cetera, people will die. Finally, people die in the ice or they survive in the ice Right, because if you get really sick, you can either make it because you go to the ICU and survive out of the ICU and you get a ventilator or other life support systems, or you do not make it in the ICU. And if you do, if you need an ICU and you do not get an ICU bed, you are going to not make it. So all these things have to be built up. Thank you, Dr. Sumit, for joining us today. I uh, wish you all the best for, you know, um, for the work that you do and thank you for the work that you do. And that's all the time we have. Keep watching. It's, it's a job. I, it's a job I have to do. There's no need to thank. There's absolutely no need to thank.